Here we'll be analyzing Photopia as an adventure of the linguistic variety. I found that Adam Cater's work intrinsically serves as both a practical language acquisition tool, as well as a language learning simulator. It's unintentionally empathetic to the quotidian struggles of second language learners. So, Cater's creation is, more broadly, a study in the gamification of language barriers. To start out slow and easy, Photopia is a game. Uh, <laughs> actually, the creator hesitates to even call Photopia a game. Photopia is a piece of interactive fiction created by Adam Cater. Simply, this is a text-based adventure. The story is displayed on screen in brief blocks of text, and the player interacts with the game by typing various commands to navigate the plot. Now, this isn't a competition, but some forums like Medium Games as Text go as far as to call this work the grandfather of interactive fiction. With this being said, Cater didn't intend to gamify language barriers, but I'd argue it's actually ideal for application within ESOL student settings for learners of English as their second language in elementary, middle, and high school. So before getting into the nuts and bolts of how I perceive this linguistic interpretation, I'll take a sentence or two disclaimer concerning video games and education, or edutainment, which does not garner the most sparkling reputation. Jonas Hyde-Smith, Simon Egenfield Nielsen, and Susanna Tosca are a few helpful voices in this topic. In their book, Understanding Video Games, they define edutainment as a class of games with a pronounced educational ambition. So, rote memorization and repetition are not intrinsic to edutainment, like in the classic examples Math Blasters and online language learning repetition games. They're just quite ubiquitous. Photopia, though, was never intended to be educational, and herein lies what I think is its greatest asset. Common edutainment tactics can't be found in the DNA of this work. Photopia is really just a different breed. To take a look at its makeup, let's bring to light first the spine of the game, the backbone. Its ergodic DNA is what really holds this work together. Let's glance over the instructions for some context. The arrow prompt appears whenever it is your turn to tell the game what you want to do. Simply type in an imperative statement, like open the door or eat the sandwich, and press the enter key. Also, articles are not necessary. Open door or eat sandwich will work just as well. The main rule of thumb here is to keep your commands as simple as you can while still getting the meaning across. From the very first few sentences, Cater deems grammatical perfection not only unnecessary to navigate his work, but actually a hindrance. What matters is the core of what the player is typing. This game celebrates the selection of precise key words over any rambling yet elegant syntactical form that might be executed by a really skilled speaker. Pretty quickly, I realized his omission of articles would be particularly helpful for native speakers of Slavic languages like Russian and Croatian, where the concept of articles doesn't exist. With that being said, ESOL students who are still building their basic understanding of formal English won't be alienated in the classroom in this activity, but instead potentially encouraged by its innately simple procedures. So it may be effective in mixed classrooms of ESOL and native speaking students, setting both on a similar skill level plane wherein the latter group won't be given any gold stars for grammatically flawless sentences. Native speakers might actually even enhance their own conciseness in writing, as Cater labels any ability to craft long, intricate sentences as a weight rather than an asset in Photopia. This function over form rule of thumb also lines up with the highly successful Swedish language curriculums already in place. As researchers Dr. Lise Kirsten Sylvan from the University of Gothenburg and Dr. Pia Sungfist from Karlsson University clarify, the important thing to remember is that students learn the language well enough to communicate. In the Swedish curriculum for language learning, the communicative aspect is at the forefront, toning down the importance of always being grammatically fully accurate. Adam Cater even provides a word bank, which offers many suggestions that players just beginning to pioneer the English language can put into their back pockets for use within the game, like to buy, to close, to drink, as well as some prepositions like look at, look inside, look under, and so forth. Okay, so now that we've looked over Cater's instructions roadmap, let's go ahead and dive into the text-based adventure itself. Within gameplay, the linguistics dynamic just gets more interesting. This piece of interactive fiction presents both restricted and open-ended response opportunities throughout the story, kind of like, once again, real conversations. First, in more simplified narrative exchanges, the game sets up the player for an answer. This simulates more straightforward speaking experiences ideal for beginning language learners, guiding them along. Questions such as, can you turn out the lights, will appear in gameplay. Here, turn out lights, borrowing wording directly from the question, is an appropriate entered response. Nothing more complicated is needed. Photopia is also inlaid with more open-ended scenarios, wherein the player could really say anything. 
creativity is encouraged. This invites more intermediate language learning to spark up a bit. For example, in the beginning of the game, the player is thrown into a scenario. There is no context of what to type next, no cues. It's very open. You decide from the infinite list of verbs and nouns in the English language of what to say. And you really could decide too to rely on that initial word bank that Adam Cater provided, but you don't need to. Photopia and its ergodic anatomy of both restricted and open-ended prompts becomes a clever tool for discussion-based language improvement. And also, side note, is this not exactly how conversations unfold every day? There's always that balanced mixture of could you turn off the lights and the world is your oyster, do or say whatever you'd like. And both of these restricted and open-ended scenarios are sprinkled with what I'll call guiding questions in Photopia. Here's one example from the instructions. If you type eat sandwich and there is more than one sandwich in your immediate vicinity, the game may respond, which sandwich do you mean? The ham sandwich or the bologna sandwich? Ham is a sufficient reply. Cater asks leading questions to deepen the conversation. It keeps the story going, even if the player doesn't have the language skills to invite specificity into their phrasing just yet on their own. They might not have the confidence or technical ability to name just what kind of sandwich they want, for instance, but Cater's piece works with them to gently expand their vocabulary. It's also quite handy that Photopia has a built-in dictionary for more difficult words presented in the text. Here's one example from the red scene, wherein Adam Cater defines the word habitable to mean you can live there. This built-in dictionary function, wherein higher level words are described in simple terms, almost as if to a child, is found quite a few times throughout the story. And now tying all of these linguistic procedural tidbits together, we can lean in a bit closer to the actual story Cater wrote and how students might interact with it in a school setting. With this being said, Photopia's function over perfection rule of thumb would pair really nicely with its universal narrative structure, as Espen Arseth and Penelope Reed do before him might help to define it, to prevent any academic stratification of ESOL and native English speaking students. When I say universal, I mean there's only one path, winding and turning, toward a center finale, unlike in the multicursal structure, wherein the maze wanderer faces a series of critical choices, or bivia. Now, don't get me wrong, the player makes choices in this work, but to paint a picture, I'll compare unicursal structures to bowling with bumpers. I know, bear with me. You can bowl with a bit of spin in your wrist, and the ball will zigzag back and forth several times before your shot hits the pins. Or, you can choose to sidestep the bumpers altogether and just throw straight. In the same way, in the white color narrative, the player can decide to either speak with Allie's colleagues on the student activities committee, Joyce and Cheryl, or to avoid them. But these aren't bivia because it doesn't actually affect the ending of the narrative at all. Awful spoiler alert, Allie will still die in a car crash in the end either way. The bowling lane itself doesn't change. Whatever way you throw the ball, bumpers or not, zigzag or straight, the player can't change the actual track that leads straight toward the same goal, the pin, so to speak. Attempts to eat the berries or even sit on the wounded wolf, as a couple more examples from the green narrative, ultimately still will not change the story. In a linguistic sense, I find an underlying argument here being made, saying, it's okay, dare, be bold, mess up, you'll still get to the same narrative. And guess what? As a player of Photopia, you will face roadblocks and it will frustrate you. As English-speaking, intelligent college students, my peers and I struggled to work through Photopia. Many times, commands we would type in just would not work. We knew what we were trying to say, but the system could not recognize its meaning, and we found ourselves at a standoff. Frustrating, isn't it? Kind of like there's a language barrier. When I played, it took me about 45 minutes to figure out that go staircase or go stairs were the exact words I needed to use to climb the stairs in the white color narrative. Phrasing like use stairs or go to stairs just would not work. I stood there feeling like I was throwing phrases into a brick wall, trying to type in a million different renditions of the same general command, being left misunderstood every time. But by my second run through, I was ready. I had learned from my previous attempts the exact words I needed to employ. Language learning mistakes can be frustrating and even embarrassing in real time, but they always inform that hypothetical next time. So it turns out the universal narrative structure I talked about falls in line with the Swedish language learning rationale I mentioned earlier. In a paper on Umeå University's research about Swedish language learners led by Inger Bergström, the following finding is presented. A successful learner takes linguistic initiatives in the target language he has not yet conquered, like trying to eat berries, sit on a wolf, or go up the stairs. Inevitably, he will form false or provisional hypotheses, either because he misunderstands, misinterprets, or receives misleading information about the language. Errors must be seen as integral parts of a language learning process. Language learning is a case study in a practically applied Silicon Valley platitude. You'll mess up, but inevitably, it'll help you out the next time you dust yourself off and get back in the game. 
So when it comes to video games in the 21st century, let's be honest, they're already quite ubiquitous among our youth. Harnessing this modern medium, like using Photopia as a language acquisition and simulation tool, might just allow us to communicate with our students more effectively by speaking a language they already understand.